Hey folks, welcome back. So to celebrate the release of Dune Part 2, I thought I'd come back and look at one of the supplements for Dune Adventures into the Imperium, the wonderful 2D20 based role-playing game from Modifius. And in fact, they have a supplement coming out in the middle of this month of March, which is called The Fall of the Imperium and is based on essentially a storyline that you'll see in the second movie. So do look forward to that. This is the great game, Houses of Lancerat, which allows you to really expand your game beyond the auspices of just Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet, and look at the Lancerad Council, the machinations of other houses in the Imperium, and the greater sort of galactic politics that are happening in the setting. And most importantly, there's a huge expansion of the house management rules, which is a really great part of the game. Uh, I'm a big fan of games where your player group has an organization or a headquarters or a base or a starship that they are responsible for and is bigger than themselves. And they can build it up and they can enhance it and, you know, become better with it over time. And Dune does that fantastically well, since you have to start out by building your house before you even build your characters. And this book heavily expands on the mechanics for increasing the domain of your house, conducting building projects, enhancing his military power, and all that stuff. Considering it's only 128 pages, they cram quite a lot in here. So we'll quickly look at the back here. So they talk about what the Lancerite is, the great council of the houses that decides the fate of the Imperium under the will of the Emperor. Meeting on Kai Tan, the Imperial homeworld, this chorus of powerful voices meet to make deals, craft alliances, crush enemies, and take vengeance in the halls of power. There you go. They give you comprehensive detail on the nature and politics of the Lancerite council, the secrets of the art of Kan Li, the rules of govern, govern assassination by blade or poison, expanded notes on Chom, which is the directorate that regulates the exchange of spice. We have a navigator's guide to the mysterious spacing guild with new talents and focuses for guild agent player characters. Another really cool addition. Then there's detail on space travel using guild hayliners and new rules for building new worlds that you can explore as part of your campaign. And finally, I think they kind of buried the lead here. <laughs> the very last thing is the complete system for house management allowing you to craft and build your do domains, construct new planetary facilities, manage downtime, and gain leverage and favor from your peers as the power of your house grows. That to me is the most important part of the book, gameplay-wise, but at the very end there, this part right here is, is the money maker. So... Without any further ado, let's take a flick open. Nothing on the end papers to report, just the black void of space. And of course we have, as usual, the lovely version of the cover art. We see two duelists with their shields on, coming at each other with blades, and somebody gripping a handful of spice. Very dramatic in the background. Great cover art for this one. And of course, a nice title page here and a very detailed, very hard to read table of contents. So we've got an introduction with an overview of the source book and its structure. Then we talk about the great game, which gives the, the book its title. So this is all about the Lancerite Council, Chom, uh, how you can create new player characters like Chom agents, talents that are associated with that. The houses of the Lancerad, the renegade houses, um, relationships within the Lancerad, relationships between houses. And then we have the stuff about Khan Lee, uh, which is actually just a, a page or two. Then we have the houses of the Lancerad. So we've got background on all the major houses. And then we have chapter three on the Spacing Guild, which gives us our guild agents, character archetypes. And there's in fact, you could be a guild engineer, financier, inspector, scientist, scout, or spy. There's some new focuses as well, new talents again, and then details on traveling the universe and creating planets. Then we have the managing your house stuff, which is, as you can see, enormous. I mean, it's the, it's the biggest chunk of the book, really. We go from page 87 all the way to page 117, after which we have a planet record sheet, moon record sheet, and a house management record sheet, and a house record sheet. We have, on top of the normal house record sheet, we now have a house management record sheet. And you can see here, the, the general features of house management are laid out, and then we have all sorts of new stuff that you could do managing ventures gaining and losing domains constructing various things boon ventures end of year and downtime and then all the way up to warfare there's a lot in this book um, and i love this illustration here we have the kind of coat of arms of all the major houses of the Lancerite Council as they exist in the Dune franchise. In the introduction, there's just some sort of scene setting here about the Lancerad, who's in it, how it works, how they link up with the Space and Guild, the Bene Gesserit, and then the houses major and minor. Titles and banners, and the Great Convention, which is a complex agreement that the Houses of the Lancerad have signed that kind of governs conflict between houses. So that includes also the aspect of Kan Li, which is the art of assassination, but also regulating warfare and creating some quite strict rules on certain aspects of fighting. So for example, can't use any atomic weapons, they're completely banned. If you use 
uh, laser guns where shields may be in play, which would cause a nuclear explosion. That's also banned. And actually doing either of those things can bring your house down to the ground. Basically, you'll be get found guilty of breaking the Great Convention and your house could be declared renegade. Your holdings and resources will be taken from you and divided amongst the peers. And your members are no longer protected by any laws of the Imperium. So basically, your enemies can hunt you down and murder you with impunity. So don't break those rules is the main message. Then we have the source book overview. And so we'll dive right in with the great game. We have a picture here of the interior of the Landsrat Council. Um, so here we talk about the nature of the council itself. So many of the more date-to-day -day rulings in the council are made by the High Council, which is around 20 to 30 representatives, and they're kind of the core power base of the Landsrat. And who actually sits there is, in theory, the people from the most powerful houses, but not every powerful house is involved in the politics of the Landsrat or is interested in getting involved in the politics. Like you would see in, say, the House of Lords in the UK, uh, often there are many empty seats in these meetings. And the membership constantly fluctuates, although a few particular great houses are reliably attending. And then we talk more about the Great Convention. Basically, this is what tries to discourage out-and-out -out warfare, allows for limited warfare, so that can involve armies and battleships and destruction of cities and all that kind of stuff. But usually this kind of thing is discouraged. And instead, you'd have the sort of ritualized art of Kanli, which is the feud between houses. It doesn't allow violence on civilians, so it's just about assassination and backstabbery. In general. So the Landsrad is really big. Uh, if we go outside just the Central Council, I mean, there's all the heads of the great major and minor houses. So there's several hundred people potentially that could attend. Every house is a single vote, but minor houses almost invariably vote along with whoever their sort of reigning major house is. It's not always feasible for the head to attend in person, so they often send proxies as well. A lot of things happen outside the meetings, of course, and they, they make that point. You know, the meetings are where official business is done, but a lot of unofficial business is happening, you know, at the grand social events that surround these meetings. Meetings. So cementing marriages, alliances, you know, scheming to take down other enemies, mutual enemies, that kind of thing. So within the Lion's Rand, basically every head of house is considered equal. They'll have one vote, but the Padisha Emperor is first among equals. So the more powerful houses dictate most of the policy, and the major houses ensure the minor houses associated with them don't undermine their agendas. And occasionally there are attempts to create some additional positions besides Secretary of the Landsrad, who does kind of the minute taking and all that kind of stuff. Any kind of additional positions tend to be short-lived because the houses don't like interference that may benefit other houses more than others, shall we say. So they prefer to keep things as they are. The Padisha Emperor is the Landsrad's chair, so he has the casting vote if there's a tie on something. The High Council does appoint judges of the change, but that always requires the Emperor's ratification. So we saw that in, you know, the, the first film, the first book, where we had Liet Kynes. They're typically imperial servants. They're the only neutral parties that are allowed to sort of mediate between houses, and they monitor the changes that are put forward by a Lance Ride decision. So it could be a, a Conley negotiation, war of assassins, change in fiefdom, that kind of thing. The Lance Ride has limited powers, according to the book here. So the head of each house has absolute authority over their subjects, but minor houses really have to carry out the wishes of the major houses. So it's difficult for the Lance Ride itself to force the head of a house to do anything. The major functions of the Lance Ride really are to ratify the emperor's decisions and to act as a form of check and balance on imperial power, but it doesn't really do that. It can voice its concerns, but the emperor has the casting vote. But the Landsrat's power is also indirect, so it can convene councils of noble houses to sit in judgment of their own, but the way those councils come together is political in itself and can steer things in certain directions. The Landsrat could also assign and remove chome directorships, so that can have a great impact on, you know, the regulation of the trade of spice and all that kind of thing. But where the Landsrat is most useful is that it just kind of mediates between the houses and helps arbitrate disputes. And there are a lot of those, because of course every noble house wants to get one over on everybody else. So the Landsrat is respected in that sense, and they hear cases where really important rules might have been broken, like the Great Convention, or if an imperial decree was violated by, by some house. The only formal subdivision is, as mentioned before, you have the kind of main body of the Landsrad, which is everybody, the head of every house, major, minor, and great. And then you have the High Council, so that's only the most powerful individuals, basically. There might be informal caucuses of houses that share certain interests, like in research or technology or that kind of stuff. And then we have a little bit more about the bureaucracy of the Landsrad, so they have experts to advise on specialist issues, they have some representatives, and they have employees that uh, a lot or allotted space in house accommodations like high tan and we have proxies of course as well as mentioned before that function on behalf of the heads of houses when they can't tend and then we have some details on kai tan itself although there's more in the next source book on that one so it's a living demonstration of the power of the emperors uh, the capital is a center of the known universe and it's just full of impressive stuff huge palaces galleries you know amazing treasures and gardens and all kinds of stuff some of these facilities are open to the public and more of them are open to the emperor's invited 
guess. So he has kind of control over all this stuff. There's a diplomatic quarter not far from the vast imperial palace, and there we have space for every house in the Landsrad. So that's quite a lot. All land on the planet is owned by the emperor, but use is granted to the houses so that they might serve the imperium and the Landsrad. Each house with land has built on their allotted land with the aim of expressing its own glory, power, and wealth. So individual houses do compete to kind of show off. They take great care not to outshine the emperor's dwellings or, or any of his great stuff, but they do compete with one another, build great mansions and you know grand grounds on their allotted land. So they typically have big houses and extensive suites and all this kind of stuff. And there could often be great rivalries happening in the streets of the diplomatic order. Here we see a kind of overview. A couple of characters here looking out over the surface of Kaitan, and we see these buildings here, you know, the Emperor's Palaces, and then we have perhaps the Landstrad Main Council happening here, and Diplomatic Quarter spread all around. We see a lot of space traffic as well, showing you how busy and how important this planet is to the functioning of the whole Imperium. So there's also some details here about the Landstrad Hall of Oratory. So it's the most re recent incarnation of the Landstrad's major meeting place. It covers an area of 750,000 square meters, and not all of it is under roofs, so you have some open gardens where you can call meetings and, and stuff like that. Like that. Each house has rooms assigned according to their status, but even the most powerful houses don't have a lot of space in there, but there are rooms with a bedroom and an office available for anyone considered a guest of the Emperor. The Central Assembly Hall itself is huge, with banked rows of seats forming circles around a raised central podium, which we saw in the illustration opening the chapter. Around the top of the hall is the so-called public gallery, which isn't public at all. So there are three tiers of cramped and unupholstered benches available for those who advise the heads of houses. It's not really for the public. It's for people that aren't important enough to actually sit in the seats, but they do need to be there to help advise the houses. And also, Mentats and Bene Gesserits can learn quite a lot from sitting in the gallery, watching the movements and behaviors of those other houses that are present and advise their own house better. So they talk about how meetings progress and what happens on the sidelines. So on the night before an important meeting, for example, it's traditional for the emperor to throw a banquet. And on subsequent nights after the meetings, guests are free to enjoy the wonders of Kaitan. Some houses might provide entertainment in the hope of gaining favor of their peers. So you can have loads of dinner parties, balls, wrestling matches. These are all opportunities for negotiations for backstabbery and Conley and all the rest of it. Many delegates remember their visit to the capital with something approaching a sense of wonder. There's so many entertainment, so many things to astound you visually. That's quite an amazing journey for anyone privileged enough to attend. So then we talk about Chom. So the Combine home Monete Ober Advancer Mercantiles whatever that means. So it's the single greatest concentration of wealth in the Imperium other than that possessed by the Emperor itself. Every single major faction within the Imperium, the Emperor, the Landsrad, and all its houses, the Bene Gesserit, and the Spacing Guild has shares in Chom and works directly with it as it controls and taxes almost all goods bought and sold everywhere, from goods as common as Pundi rice to services as esoteric as space travel. Obviously, the most lucrative substance they deal with is spice, and the spice is the foundation of the economy of the, of the Imperium with all prices set according to the market value of spice. Then we get into the structure of Chom. So it has a set of directors appointed by the Emperor and usually leaders of the great houses of the Imperium. The Spacing Guild and the Bene Gesserit, however, are silent partners with no official directorships or voting privileges, but they do have influence, of course, because the Spacing Guild has a monopoly on space travel, which is how anybody gets anywhere, and the Bene Gesserit are secretly spinning everybody's wheels behind the scenes. So it's a massive bureaucracy. It governs all trade, setting all economic policy, and enforcing fairness and trade between houses. Besides the Spacing Guild, it's perhaps the most powerful body in the Imperium, and it's the source from which all houses ultimately draw their wealth and have shares in. So for that reason, it might be e even more important than the Landsrat. There is a relationship between them because, of course, every house has a share in Chom as well. So Chom has a high degree of political power of its own and is occasionally used as an instrument of the Landsrat to enforce its will upon the Imperium. So then Chom is also tied to the Guild Bank, so that's the Space and Guild's financial division, and they're the ones that transport goods across the universe and monitor all off-planet trade. So Chom and the Guild Bank are basically moving in lockstep at all times. For most people, they're kind of uh, seen as indistinguishable and they never really seem to act independently. They're always, you know, sharing the same interests. And then they have a little sidebar here about the Imperial Audit, which, like the IRS, getting audited by the Imperials is not a good thing. It's especially tense and precarious. So an audit can be called by either the Emperor or the President of Chom, though the Bene Gesserit and Spacing Guild might suggest it and expect it to be carried out due to their level of influence. So basically, they send a special team from Chom and the Guild Bank to land on your primary planet of the house and put an immediate and all-encompassing freeze on all economic activity and trade, only allowing select industries continue like spice harvesting because it's so important to the Imperium. They get all your finance records, all reports, and you have to cooperate fully with their agents. 
in some cases, they even send Mentats and Bene Gesserit to just make sure that they get the correct information, shall we say. The orders answer directly to the Emperor. They could end up with mild, heavy fines, economic sanctions, or denial of guild access, which would be disastrous. Could even mean loss of a directorship, loss of shares, or even stripping a house of its status. So getting demoted from house major to house minor, or even getting removed from the land right entirely. Now we have the option to be Chome player characters, which is pretty cool. Creating a play ca player character with allegiance to Chome presents an interesting dynamic. Wherever money and business go, Chome follows. So if a player character wants to focus on trade, then that can be an appropriate role for them to fill. And they're most often found in houses with an artistic, farming, industrial, military, or science areas of expertise, because those are areas that tend to lead to trade. So there you might expect that somebody with an allegiance to Chome might be valuable. It might be that the agent is assisting the house for their internal business and economic ventures, but for the most part, they'll be sure that they're to ensure that the house gets rich and that Chome gets their share of the profits. A bit of a dual allegiance there, which would be really fun for role playing. Then they advise you about the core roles that would be particularly well suited for a Chome agent, so an advisor. In this case, the Chome advisor would have an understated yet powerful weapon that is a house's wealth, counseling the house's rulers and their family in all matters relating to trade, Chome, and the Guild Bank. A Chome envoy almost inevitably has a directorship or is being groomed for a directorship. They oversee and negotiate trade deals between the houses and other organizations and see to it that Chome gets their due profits. And then you have the treasurer, of course, so they look to see that the house's finances are in order and able to withstand the dreaded threat of a Chome audit. They give you a template for a uh, Chome agent. They're serving two masters embedded within their house and works to ensure the house's profitability, but they also serve Chome's greater interest and occasionally be asked to spy upon their own house for the corporation. They gain an additional trait of Chome agent. Their suggested archetypes are analyst, courtier, envoy, steward, or strategist, and mandatory talents include Hand of Chome. So their Chome status is going to be the most important weapon that the Chome agent can wield. And there's some talents that go along with this. So the Hand of Chome is required when you're involved in a test dealing with your planet or galactic trade, you may use your influence on, as a member of Chome. Once per session on such a test, you may apply the effects of spending a point of determination on the trade test. Doing so reveals your Chome connections to all involved by necessity. Other talents you can do, like an audit, so you can spend one momentum to insist a house or other Chome trade member show you the records of their recent trade dealings. They have to show you something. They could be falsified records, but they have to show you something. You can spend a point of momentum to obtain information, ask two questions for the first point of momentum spent rather than one. Let's check the books. Deep pockets, you can create an asset of wealth to use in trade deals. Lost at the end of the scene, but you can increase its quality when you create it by one for each momentum spent. Dirty money, when facing any sort of challenge or test relating to concealing the source of wealth. With a successful discipline test, you may spend one plus momentum to transfer one illegal asset, one level of quality an asset possesses, into a legitimate and thoroughly legal asset for the duration of a scene. For two momentum per asset or level of quality for one scene, you may temporarily make an asset belonging to another character or house suspect. So basically, you can launder money or you can make somebody else's money look dirty. You have the master of coin, potentially, so whenever you make a financial or economic related skill test, you may re-roll 1d20 if it's not a success, specifically when dealing with circumstances when Chome's influence would be relevant. When using the house management system, which we'll see later in the book, you can add plus five to your house's wealth status for the rest of a session by making a challenging difficulty to understand test. Finally, we have report malfeasance. You may give at any time another character the complication reported to Chome. So this represents you having sent a report to Chome of illegal or unfair trading or financial affairs on the part of the target. The target must be someone who would be bothered by a Chome audit, such as a house agent, rather than a regular street market trader. The complication lasts until the target can prove their innocence or a Chome investigation is complete. So you can use this as much as you want, but if you do it too many times, then Chome might punish you for wasting their time. They could expel you from Chome, even, or they could just take the talent away from you. All right, so now we get into the background of the Houses of Lansrad. So the Lansrad has the power to recognize the house. So if a new house emerges, it has petitioned the houses for inclusion, and once recorded and accepted, or a vote on the petition is called, and the house is either accepted or rejected. However, a new house has to be rather ratified further by the Emperor. Without the assent of the Emperor, you've got no hope. Anyway, so let me talk about the differences between the houses great and small. So the great houses typically have the membership in the High Council. Then we have the major houses. They hold power through a mixture of tradition and, territor and territory and resources. Most of the great houses are really ancient. They've been around for thousands of years, like Harkonnens and the Atreides and all that stuff. Many smaller houses have not survived. So most minor houses are attached to a house major, but this is not always the case. Well, generally, a house minor is any house without a full planetary fiefdom. Instead, they control or rule some smaller but significant location or resource. So you can be elevated into a house minor from being a lesser house. And so some house minor exist independently, so they're not actually a vassal to a house major. These could be actual former great houses or major houses that have been diminished in power. You know, maybe they broke the Great Convention or did some other thing wrong or pissed off Chome or something like that. And most houses major and most prominent houses minor are linked to the lion throne by their bloodline which is also interesting, sort of going back to the ancient aristocracies and feudal governments of medieval Europe. So there are also renegade houses. If you go renegade to avoid a punishment, 
That means you basically forfeit your lands and holdings and all your rights and privileges. Your houses, holdings and resources are divided amongst your peers. Basically, everybody fights over what's the, what are the choices of bits that you had. And then you must retreat outside the Imperium to some unknown world if you have any hope of survival. But most don't survive that. They either get murdered by their allies, well, former allies and enemies, or they change into something entirely different from being a house. They're just a sort of random gathering of people. Renting in houses can come from a noble house rising too far and too fast, which would cause the emperor or great houses concern, and they would try to cut you down. So then we have the ultimate destination of many surviving renegades is Tupal, a region of space known only to the guild. Many renegades pay for transport there and enter exile with their families and retainers. They try to survive as best they can. If you get there, you can have sanctuary, but only if you remain there, because only the guild knows about it. Little is known of the exact state and location of this place. It's a closely guarded guild secret, so it can be seen to be more of a gilded cage because it's largely populated by old nobles and guild agents. Exiles with enough wealth likely live quite well there outside of the Imperium. They don't have the power they once had, and they don't have the freedoms of travel or anything, but at least they, they still live a good lifestyle. So relations within the Landstrad are complicated, so of course you have to think about not just your relationship between the other houses, but your relationship to the Emperor and the current whims of the Emperor. Your relations with Chome. There's a side note here as well about Atomic. So most noble houses have stockpiles of atomic weapons. People keep them around just in case they're needed in some heinous war or something, but the use of these weapons against civilian populations is forbidden by the Great Convention, and if you use them, the punishable result is planetary annihilation. So that's a pretty big deal. And when a house goes renegade, so their hoarded atomics are often an issue. Many houses will try to take them. Exiled houses will often try to take the weapons with them into exile, but often these atomics are sold or stolen by agents of other houses. That could make for a really interesting high stakes intrigue campaign, they point out, which I think I agree with. And then we have some information about the relations between houses. Relations between major houses major are incredibly important, but rather limited. They are either allies, enemies, or conditionally both or neither. Some houses are bitter enemies, and they've had hostility for centuries or even millennia. And despite the efforts of the Bene Gesserit, there's no real path to sort of sealing the gaps between these enemies. They just run too deep. So the, the bonds between houses tend to be extreme. There's a little sidebar here about the God Emperor era, which broke the normal balance of power. Lansrat is still a potent part of the governance of humanity during that time, but the ascension of Maudib kind of really changes the whole makeup of, of political power. So bear that in mind if you're setting a campaign in that era. So relationship between houses major and minor. Basically, it's a vassal relationship. A house minor should be acting on behalf of its ruling house, and they can't really do something on their own because if they try to do something without the backing of their house major, it's, it's simply too risky to go up against a more powerful house. They do sometimes have problems with their patron house as well. So a house major would do well to keep their house of minor satisfied because you never know when a house minor might suddenly stab you in the back. So even the Harkonnens, for all the famous abuses and cruel excess, treat their houses minor well enough, at least until they have reason to abandon or betray them. <laughs> <laughs> so vassals of the minor houses often intermarry, train together, and pool resources. So you get practical alliances between houses minor because they're all in the same boat, I guess. They're trying to help each other to rise in the ranks, really. That's ultimately the goal of any house minor is to gain more power and influence. Particularly houses minor serving the same house majors really relate to each other with a mix of fellowship and rivalry. Even though they're on the same team, you know, there's a little bit of competition there about who is getting the most attention from the house major. And the house major tends to encourage this. You know, a bit of rivalry and competition is good for keeping people motivated. So, unconnected minor houses usually interact according to their personal histories and their current agendas. You know, they, they don't have a lot of reach because a house minor wouldn't have access to a lot of space travel. So, basically, they would interact through their house major or through chance encounters in dinner parties or, or other things surrounding the Landstrad Council. And then, of course, the other groups. The houses of the Landstrad are the largest employers of Mentats. Most houses major keep the best Mentats for themselves, and they sometimes will poach Mentats from fallen houses. And, of course, the sisters of Benny Gessert are strongly connected to all houses, major and minor. So sisters and Benny Gessert trained candidates are often concubines, wives, advisors, advisors, and truthsayers. Many nobles view these women as subordinates, but those paying attention will realize that these sisters are following their own goals. Some houses also have space and guild agents attached to them, so especially those that ship goods and personnel regularly. That's where, you know, if you have a, a house that deals in industrial aspects, uh, scientific research, technology, those sort of things, you would may well have a chum agent in your employ. You also will have relationships with the Ginaz sword masters and soup doctors, of course. These are typically employed by the noble houses for their supposedly unshakable loyalty. But also, you can find yourself as a major house or minor house, sometimes employing smugglers or other criminal types, and you might either be hunted down, you might be recruited 
limited, depending on how good you are, what you do. Then we get into the Art of Khan Li. So the rules of Khan Li are ancient and extensive. So the basic tenets are listed here. So a conflict that has become a vendetta must be formally announced to all parties by the offended house. The recipients of any decoration of Khan Li can't refuse it, but they must be warned with enough time to offer amends. Weapons capable of causing large-scale collateral damage against non-military targets are discouraged or outright forbidden. So if atomics, of course, are out of the question. Laser guns and shields, um, same thing. Double agents, spies, and traders are all allowed. Breaking or converting agents of verified and strong loyalties. Bene Gesserit, Sadakar is both admirable and dangerous. Assassins are encouraged, but their methods have to conform with accepted practices. So again, you have to kill somebody carefully and tar- in a targeted way and not affect any civilians. Uh, occasional peace offerings and dip- diplomatic outreach is expected, but these are often insincere. Enemies don't need to accept them, but they are expected to respond officially and pro- politely. Kunli is allowed and expected, but it doesn't excuse crimes. So a noble may slaughter an enemy with it, within its customs, but still face an imperial truth say an investigation for the act, depending on who they killed. Houses uninvolved with the vendetta will withdraw from conflict areas until everything blows over. The formal declaration of Conley offers them the opportunity to do so. Only the strongest connections between allied houses survive extended acts of Conley. Finally, enemy houses may ally against a single target, though the forms and customs are still enforced. Even if a house is outgunned and outnumbered, it can hope for a certain amount of restraint in the interest of general peace. Practical application of Conley is to formalize a war of assassins between rival houses. So this is a kind of cold war of secret killers and deadly intrigue. You try to weaken the important members of a house through murders and assassination and subterfuge. You try to weaken them beyond their ability to recover. So first you have to declare your intent, of course, with the guild, the landsrad, and the imperial court. The conflict is monitored by imperial judges to ensure it doesn't become too widespread. The emperor and other powerful factions are ideally neutral, but as we've seen, that's not always the case. <laughs> so approved methods of war of assassins are outlined in the Assassin's Handbook, an ancient text well known to nobles, their advisors, and especially their house mentats and masters of assassins. So that includes the use of poisons, hunter seekers, double agents, and other methods. Um, so that's all you get on Khan Lee. I mean, they, they put a big blurb about that on the back of the book, but it's really not that hard to understand. So now we get into the Houses of the Landsrad. I'm not going to go through the detail of all these. It's more fun to get the book and read them yourselves. I'll just outline who they are and their major domains. We have the House of Lexin, their slogan being Reap as You Sow. They have a nice little piece of wheat there as their banner. So the colors are Harvest Yellow. Uh, their house traits are industrious and pragmatic. The primary domain is farming produce, so wheat, gourds, and other staple foods. Secondary domains are farming machinery and logistics machinery, so uh, machinery to transport bulk foodstuffs. And their home world is Karis, or Kora 2, a lush, fecund world with large regions of arable land and mild climate. They also have some holdings elsewhere in the system, and a dozen other minor, minor worlds under contract that it runs as agricultural worlds. Uh, and those give it links with other houses as well. And you get details about the important noble family members, some history, prominent minor houses, and their overall agenda. Again, I put that in kind of spoilery territory, so I'm not going to read too much into that. House of Trades. No call, we do not answer. Of course, we know these guys. So their banner is green and black with the hawk crest. Their house traits are honorable and popular, which is why the emperor didn't like them so much. Primary domain is produce, so humble pundi rice, the staple uh, staple food throughout the Imperium. Secondary domain is farming produce, so their home planet of Caladan enjoys lots of delicious fish, uh, which can be used for oil and flesh. And also, they're artistic as well, so they have passionate and fair diplomats, and their talents at negotiation have helped sway many conflicts. They also have military expertise like that should be highlighted there, but it's not. So Atreides tacticians and instructors are highly sought after. Their home world is Caladan for 26 generations, so it's dominated by massive o- oceans, rich in life, interrupted by small continental land masses. And they have these vast fields of Pundi rice and loads of fishing and agricultural families all across the planet. Uh, no other holdings. They have a well-disciplined and ferociously loyal military as a defense force. And of course, as we know, later on, they get given the poison chalice of ruling Arrakis. Then we have House Ikaz, the forest endures. So their banner is light green and their crest is Yggdrasil, the world tree. So we're going back to Norse mythology there with that one. Primary domains farming and forestry. So they produce Iluka wood, fog wood, and tent silk. They have rich worlds and forests for that. Secondary domain is pharmaceuticals. So their jungles provide the basis for many pharmaceutical products such as Iluka, Samuta, Verite, and Sappho, which is what the, the juice the Mentats drink. And they also have great understanding of Lancerad politics. So they're based on Alpha Centauri B4 on the world they call Ikaz, an ecologically rich jungle world. There's one inhabited moon orbiting Ikaz and no other colonized planets in the home system and no other holdings. They keep a standing army, but nothing exceptional. They have House Hagal, the brightest jewel. They have a sky blue banner with a fan crest. They're ambitious and wealthy. Their primary domains are industrial produce. So the mining facilities are vast on their home planet of Hagal. They are the preeminent mineral miners in the Landsrad. 
So they're known producing Sioux stones and fire opals. Many of the Carino crown jewels were mined there, and the imperial throne itself is fashioned of Hagal quartz. Their secondary domains include industrial machinery, so that's machinery for sustaining their mining operation, and their single inhabitable moon around Hagal is dedicated to the production of this machinery. They also produce artistic works. The long, exhausting work in the mines has resulted in a type of rhythmic chanting and folk music, often accompanied by a balisette. Quickly became popular throughout the Imperium. So Hagalese folk music groups are in demand across the known universe. How cool is that? So the home world is called Hagal, the jewel planet, a world of vast mountain ranges and generally cold temperatures, possesses unsurpassed mineral resources. Despite its vast wealth, they've invested relatively little in its military forces until recently. The union between Carino and Hagal altered this, with the minor house Ptolemy being used to quickly train and mobilize a small but highly trained and highly equipped expeditionary force. There you go. That's House Hagal. Then the notorious House Harkonnen. Their banner is red and black, and they have the sigil crest. Traits are brutal and cunning. Accurate. Their farming is spice, so they're the current governors of Arrakis at this point in the history. They manage spice production over all of Arrakis. They make unbelievable shed loads of money for that, of course. They also produce refined alloys on their homeworld, so their whole homeworld is basically one giant industrial plant. It's really hideous and polluted. Secondary domains include industrial produce, crude utilitarian and cheap derivative of high-quality goods fashioned elsewhere. They also produce whale fur. The planet of Lankavale's oceans are home to a furred whale, harvested almost to extinction for its meat and oil, but especially for its rich fur, coveted by the wealthy throughout the Imperium. So they have the, their main planet of Gady Prime, which is fully industrialized and the seat of power for many generations. There's only a few preserves that are not refineries, and these are used for timber farms. The pollution is really heavy, and everywhere on Gady Prime is smog-choked and poorly lit, even at midday. They have a powerful military force, emphasizing shock troops and other inf infantry-led strategies. Discipline is severe and morale can fluctuate wildly. <laughs> And we have a little bit more detail about, of course, their horrible Baron Vladimir Har Harkonnen, Beast Raban, Fade Rotha, all those evil guys. House Canola. So their banner is white. The crest is an open book. Their traits are they're dogma dogmatic and faithful. So the primary domains are religious. So they produce an array of religious paraphernalia with some of the most impressive and well-crafted Bibles in the Imperium. And their secondary domain, so they have a retreat on Caliburn, is a renowned sanctuary for contemplation and introspection, and they also produce acclaimed religious artwork and poetry. The homeworld of Allgrave, also known as Andala IV, is a habitable but quite bleak planet of mostly scrubland and quite cold most of the time. Other holdings include Caliburn, so that's a cold, barren rock of a world that houses their monastic retreat, a barely breathable atmosphere that has little water and almost no soil. It's mostly a rock, uh, but its thin atmosphere does grant an excellent Excellent view of the night sky. They have a small standing army and a standard planetary defense system. It essentially maintains the minimum for planetary defense so it's not an easy target, but they don't really want to invade anybody and they try to stay neutral which is sensible, I think. We've got House Lindarin, nothing built without foundation. Their banner is deep blue, and their crest is a scythe with three blades along it. Their house traits are passionate and righteous. Primary domain is industrial produce. They specialize in lichen-based fabrics and foodstuffs, inexpensive to make, ship, and purchase. They also manufacture small arms and ammunition, mostly for use as self-defense for the average citizen, so not military weapons. They also have industrial understanding, deep knowledge of the complex logistics required to sell and distribute across the known universe. Their homeworld, Rosni, is a frozen, desolate world, but only on the surface. Underneath its crust, a robust society functions using the planet's core for heat and energy. They also have another holding as Osminia, their orbiting station. So that's where all interactions with anybody off-planet takes place. Most people live under the surface, and when they need to interact with somebody else, they go onto the orbiting station on Osminia. They have a large, well-trained, but lightly armed military. They're happy to send their troops to the aid of any they perceive as fighting injustice. House Maros, ours is the hunt. Their banner is sunshine yellow and their crest is the bull. Their house traits are just and respectful. Primary domain is farming produce. The tender, buttery meat of the famous Maros deer is a sought-after delicacy throughout the Imperium. They also produce industrial machinery, so they've created ways to make their factories and abattoirs as unobtrusive as possible by banishing them to their moons. They also have artistic expertise due to their dedication to the beauty of nature. So the home world of Grenbell, Mycoptera 14, is a serene pastoral planet full of verdant valleys, rolling hills, lush with green, grain dancing in the gentle breezes, and picturesque snow-covered mountains. So Cardir is a small planet nicknamed the Slaughterhouse, and has been transformed over time into a massive nightmarish factory farm run by Zekma, a house miner under Maros. They also have three small moons. All unsavory or ugly work processes occur off-planet to ensure Grand Bell's unspoiled and bucolic image. They mostly rely on their stellar reputation and highly coveted venison to discourage conflict with other houses. The risk of having the house Maros cut off supply is too great for most houses to dare open conflict with them. 
Their deer meat is just that good. We got House Mikarol. We hold the chains. Their colors are purple. Their crest is a mailed fist. That's very cool. House traits, cruel and immoral. The primary domain is farming and industrial. They have vast dens of human misery beneath the mega cities of Tengrid by House Mikarol's slave holdings. Here human beings are bought, appraised, costed, and offered up for sale. Some brought to these huge pens have been kidnapped by Mikarol's roving bands of slave takers. Many more have been sold into slavery to pay off debts. Wow, that's horrible. They also have vast grass plains on Tengrid, home to a variety of herd animals, many of which were brought from ancient ancient earth at some point in the remote past. So they've been carefully tended over millennia and they have vast resources of meat which they can sell for other houses. Desperately needed source of food for the enslaved as well. They also conduct frequent expeditions to other planets in search of more unfortunate subjects to their barbaric treatment but they also get frequent contact with alien flora and fauna so they have great databases on alien creatures and plant life. Their home world is a lush verdant world covered with vast grasslands and a population of approximately 1 billion but then they have almost 4 billion slaves. Yuck. No major armed forces but large numbers of allied pirates and raiders so when they need to defend themselves they can. Basically nobody wants to touch them because they do slavery. That's the main message. Then we have House Moritani. Might is power. Their colors are black. They're crested the horse. They're independent and vengeful. So the primary domain is military machinery. So they have an immense stockpile of atomics and other munitions, far beyond the house's ability to transport and utilize on the battlefield. They also sell raw materials, chief, chiefly salt, that it can't invest directly into its war effort. They're also experts in Khan Lee. So a lifetime spent in bitter feuds with its rivals has trained Moritani mercenaries and assassins to be the best. So their ancestral home is Grumman, second planet in the Nushe star system, officially known as She Draconis II. It's a dying planet with scant resources. It's two continents boasting great tropical forests, sadly being harvested and not replaced, and it's been strip-mined. The countryside is poisoned with manufacturing waste products. Its natural abundance all but depleted. Its cities now teem with rural refugees forced into the, in into the increasingly unlivable cities. They have many weapons caches, hidden military bases, and defensive satellites orbiting Grumman. They also own the pleasure planet Gamont, the third planet in its system, famed for its hedonism and sexual progressiveness. They have tremendous military, military power and have always been warlike, and its military nature dominates. Long simmering grudges with houses of Kaz and Ginaz have led to open conflict with both. So they have a heightened state of readiness against retaliation, and they have enormous stores of atomic weapons and explosive munitions. Pretty hardcore warfarers. They have House Mutelli, we know. Their colors are white, and the crest of the Tudor Rose. House traits are respected and unthreatening. Primary domains, so they have political expertise. They're great at diplomacy and mediation. Their secondary domains, they have information, secret, and favors, which are always of great value in the land shroud. And they are of expertise in Khan Lee. So they offer consultation as the best means to murder people. Their home world is Katnov, Alderam in the fourth, a cold world with a more pleasant temperate zone around the equator, which is where most people live. They also have several space stations near key systems to better supply the Imperium with their diplomatic services. They're not known for its soldiers or weaponry, but their forces are competently trained and numerous, and they are functional enough to protect the house's assets. They are the diplomats offering their services to the rest of the Imperium. They have House Nova Bruins, Prosperity from Darkness. Their banner is K. Brown, their crest is a cut gemstone. Their house traits are cutthroat and expansionist. Sounds pleasant. Primary domain is valuable refined ore of numerous varieties from mines located all over the Imperium. They also produce mineral extraction tools, machinery, and vehicles, as well as smelting and ore processing facilities as a secondary domain, and science data, particularly planetological data and expertise, which is the basis for the house's unparalleled skill at mining. So Nova Bruins itself is a mostly barren, rust-colored, desolate planet bathed in the glow of a red giant sun. They have efficiently mined out their own world to the point where it's almost totally depleted, so they often buy a lot of their own products back to themselves. The Royal Palace was relocated from Nova Bruns to its moon Cleone 20 years ago. In addition to their homeworld, Menkar 3, 5, 6, and several moons of Menkar 4 have also been partially or mostly mined out. They're currently mining the moons of Menkar 7 and will officially begin on those of Menkar 8 later this year. They hope to begin mining from the super hot surface of Menkar 1 within the next few years, as soon as they can work out a way to do so safely. They don't have much of a military at all beyond its reasonably well-trained Royal Guard and security officers. It tends to hire elite mercenary defense troops from House Linnell, one of its closely affiliated minor houses, if they need to defend themselves. Then we have House Richesi, Technology Under Faith. They've got a cool banner as well, light blue with a, a lamp crest. Their house traits are innovative and resourceful, so they produce industrial miniaturization. So the crowning achievement is reflective mirrors which serve as miniaturized power chips for sophisticated machinery used throughout the Empire. They also are known for their more recently developed Richesian data coils. They also produce hayliners. Though still recovering from their economic war with House Vernius, Richesius continues the mass construction of interplanetary transports. Although once devastated by Omnius, Richesius is once again a bright blue-green world. War and environmental devastation forced the population into several moderate-sized cities scattered across the planets. Unfortunately, some debris from the Shattered Moon of Corona occasionally makes it through the gauntlet of protection, striking the surface every few months. Ouch. 
So ever since the Emperor destroyed Corona, Richez's artificial moon, the House has adopted a strictly defensive posture. They've devoted the bulk of their military to a planetary defense to delay a potential invasion long enough to provide the population ample opportunity to escape. We got House Spinette, the two-sided blade. Their colors are twilight orange and their crest is the knife. And their traits, appropriately enough, are cunning and discreet. And their primary domain is Kanli, so they train assassins on their homeworld of Drain and it deploys them all over the Imperium for a price. They also have expertise with poisons and extensive techniques to hide them in elaborate meals, meaning they also train incredible chefs. And to stay competitive, they also create drugs, poisons, and a variety of unique flavor extracts used by both assassins and culinary geniuses. Their home planet, Drain, Enthi the Seventh, is a planet of extreme environments, harsh tundra, steep mountain peaks, scorching deserts, and dense forests, all populated by vicious animals and deadly plants. It's a perfect place to cultivate assassination skills. They have no other holdings outside of that. Their military power, they have a sizable, well-trained military and planetary defenses, and nobody wants to hire an assassin from a house that can't protect itself, so they need to have that, basically. But they use their military purely for defense. They don't want to antagonize other houses. They just want to serve the need for expert assassins. Beautiful cooking and fantastic poisons and sauces. House Taligari, nobility is all, so their banner is teal, their crest is scales. Their house traits are artistic and deceptive, so they're recognized for their poets, dancers, playwrights, and all manner of creative talents, that's their primary domain. Secondary domain is leading the way in stage, craft, and performance technology, and also politics, so many actors and stage technicians get their training here, and then go on to join troops resident with houses or traveling the Imperium. The home world is Artesia, a beautiful vacation spot, almost a rival to Kaitan itself. They do have some other... Holdings, they were gifted nine planets as fiefs by the Emperor. This vast fortune of land has allowed them to grow wealthy with only minimal exploitation. They have no real military presence. They have family atomics on Artesia and a small standing army, but it's largely ceremonial. Uh, so they're focused on their arts. House Thorbald, the Hammer of Wealth. Their colors are indigo and yellow. They've got a cool crest, the Thor's Hammer Mjolnir there. Their house traits are diligent and competitive. They mainly produce refined alloys. Reflected in the hammer, they specialize in the smelting and refining of precious alloys, often required for spacecraft and other large vehicles. Secondary domain is military, so they have the War Academy on Epir, known for producing some of the most tactical mines in the galaxy, run entirely by Mentats. That's cool. They've got a great home world, habitable planet, dominated by extensive hills and mountain ranges. Ranges, and they have some other holdings, including the Empyrean Asteroid Belt, which is the primary source of alloys and minerals. And they also have an orbital refinery called the High Forge. The refinery is so large, gravimetrically speaking, that it acts as Epir's unofficial moon. They don't have the military might of houses like Atreides and Harkonnen, but it has turned guerrilla warfare into an art. Uh, the army favors cell structures, considers the squad the most critical military unit, and has given them the ability to take independent action based on chain of command recommendations. Then we got House Vernius, Truth from Science. Their banner is purple and copper, and their crest is the double helix. I like that. Very cool. Nicely stylized as well. So the house traits are cunning and creative. Their primary domain is industrial technology. So having supplanted their rival, House Riches, House Vernius is the primary producer of hayliners for the Spacing Guild. It also manufactures sophisticated machines, warships, a form of space-capable ornithopter, weather controls, and Ixian memory stones. Their secondary domain is spy equipment. So they also produce spy eyes, hunter seekers, and surveillance devices. This is the planet Ix, basically, is their main world. A devastated wasteland is seen from orbit. The vast majority of Ixians, however, to well beneath the surface. For their efforts during the Akazi Revolt, Emperor Elru IX granted House Vernia several additional planets. The Bene Tleilax then took these worlds for a time, but they've since been reclaimed. The standing army of House Vernia is formidable. Its commanders and most of the rank-and-file shield infantry are fearless in battle and hardened by the war to retake Ix from the Bene Tleilax. This fact, matched with their sophisticated technology and counter-surveillance apparatus, gives most potential adversaries a moment of pause. The Ixians make no secret of the fact that they will not allow their world to be taken again, no matter the cost. Then we have House Widris, the shadows are listening. Their colors, sea green, and the crest, Laza Tiger. House traits, subtle, impartial, and refined. So the primary domain is espionage. So they are claimed to be the greatest practitioners of the art of espionage, developing new techniques to ensure they remain undetectable, refining approaches and methods, and inventing new means of avoiding capture and gathering information. This expertise is communicated to others outside the house for enormous sums of money. The espionage schools of House Widris are legendary. They also produce enormous amounts of information due to all the spying. So the data banks on Emmaus... Their enormous, expansive libraries, archives, vid files dominates much of the world city, constantly added to and expanding, tended to by more than a billion archivists. They're also cultivating independence of thought to ensure successful espionage. So they cultivate it in their citizens, encouraging questions, challenges to orthodoxy and new ideas. It does so with care, but its universities and schools are some of the highest quality, especially its theological colleges. Quadrassian priests are among the most revered and respected in the Imperium. Their homeworld is almost entirely urbanized, so it's kind of like Coruscant in Star Wars. 
And of course, Star Wars is heavily influenced by Dune. So it's just a giant city with a population of approximately 4 billion. It's not a big planet, though. So it's not a trillion like you have on Coruscant. It is notable for having one of the largest populations of Mentats in the Imperium. And uh, their military power is formidable. Among, they're among the most well-defended planets in the Imperium. Their standing army is restricted to a series of small, well-trained commando squadrons, though. Should they be directly attacked, their carefully positioned assets inside virtually every major house and organization means they possess far more direct means of defending themselves, or so goes the theory. Cool. All right, so now we get into the Spacing Guild. There's a little definition here of what they are. But of course, if you've gotten this far in looking into Dune, you probably know what the Spacing Guild is. They, of course, have a monopoly on space travel in the known universe. They run Guild Hayliners, which are gigantic spaceships that can carry hundreds and hundreds of smaller ships, including the entire contents of a major house or a great house that we saw in Dune. So here we go more into the details of the Guild, their relationship to the Guild Bank, which was spoken about a bit before, has expanded upon here. And the Guild Chum and the Landstrider in their relationship. Uh, the most powerful tool the guild has at its disposal is simply to refuse service. So if they won't ship anything for you, then basically you can't do anything. You can't exert force outside your own system. You don't have any access to FTL travel. You don't have access to trade. And the guild basically can transport things near instantaneously. So if you don't have access to that, you're screwed. So while the Landstrad and the Emperor possess military power and generate all the wealth, they must negotiate carefully with the guild because the guild has this monopoly over space travel. And the wealth doesn't mean much if you can't exert it to create power against your foes, basically, and keep them in line. In the same way, Chum can do little without the guild providing with the funds by which they pay out their shareholders, and the Spacing Guild is the one that moves the spice, which is the main profit maker for Chum. The Spacing Guild holds a lot of cards, however, it needs access to vast quantities of spice, and so it has to be careful in its own negotiations as well. And in fact, it's a well-known secret that the guild collaborates with smugglers, in particular with spice smugglers, even while pretending that it doesn't. So we know that, for example, on Arrakis, they um, intentionally look away with some of their satellites so that they can meet with Fremen spice smugglers and get additional supplies of spice off the books. So Junction is planet in two orbital stations where the guild's great hayliners are maintained and navigators are trained, spending their entire lives in zero-g environments, never breathing atmosphere and never touching the ground. So the navigators, of course, are basically the incredibly spice-infused and mutated creatures that guide the interstellar hayliners through the process of folding space. The only way to do that is to have the prescience and prophetic nature of spice deep within your bloodstream. So that's what the navigators do. And since the guild is the only one with navigators and the only one with highliners, they're the only ones who can travel space safely. So how are they organized? Well, they have a leadership branch. They have uh, the administrators who do that. They have the operations branch, which is the day-to-day -day functioning of the guild. And that's their technicians and all the navigators as well. And it's the largest of the groups within the space and guild, outnumbering the rest by at least a thousand to one. Got a lot of business to do. Then we've got the Guild Bank, which interfaces with Chom and the Landsrad directly, and it's the most direct contact that the Guild has with anybody outside of the Guild itself. Finally, you have the Guild Navigator School, but it's not really a school, it's a breeding and genetic screening program. They search for potential navigators across the Imperium, subject them to an intense regimen of psychological testing, forced mutation, and training. So other than navigators, whose garments are specially constructed, constructed to support their mutated forms, the standard uniform for almost all members of the Guild is plain and dark gray. You can see over here. Most public members of the guild are the brokers, so these are the people who handle the logistics and payment for the transport of goods and personnel in guild spaceships, arranging surface-to-space shuttles for those who don't possess ships capable of spaceflight, and providing instructions for how to load and prepare spaceships and the passengers for transport within a hayliner. They can even be assigned permanently to a house, handling their arrangements exclusively. They also have guild bank representatives. These are accountants, tax officials, and actuaries, and work with Chome to ensure that everything is done correctly. They have the technicians, but there's a huge number of them, but they're largely unknown outside the guild. So they are the engineers, crafters, mechanics, technicians, designers, and other personnel required to keep the giant Highliners operational, as well as the conventional space fleet of transport shuttles and other crafts. And finally, they have the Guild Ambassadors, so they operate within the Landstrike Council as representatives for the Guild. They don't have an actual title, but that's what they're referred to internally, I suppose. A greater major house will inevitably have a full-time Guild Ambassador assigned to it, usually with full access to the house's highest levels of administration. The only title of the Guild's hierarchy known outside the Guild are the Administrators, who are managerial functionaries who answer to the Chief Administrator, whose identity is unknown. Then there's a bit about the the navigators here, so they talk about the horrors of the training process, and some survivors don't qualify, muster out, and become guild agents, serving in other capacities, while well, some have gone too far and uh, basically are 
screwed over medically. They're mutated too much and can't recover. Occasionally, a navigator's attendants may deal with those outside the guild, but almost nobody from the Landstrad has met an actual navigator face-to-face, even if separated by a wall of transparent plasteel and shrouded in a thick veil of spice gas. If anybody ever meets a navigator outside of a hayliner or junction, it will be the most extraordinary levels of secrecy and security, and only in the most extraordinary circumstances, such a threat to the guild or the Imperium itself or the spice trade. Then we have rules for guild agents, yay! Uh, so you can create a player aligned with the space guild in the core rulebook, but here we have some more support for that option. However, you can't make a navigator because they're too important and secretive and there's no way that they'd ever deal with normal people so wouldn't be very much fun to have a guild navigator character that doesn't participate in anything when choosing to play a house-based guild agent player character what do they do in the house do they have a personal connection are they a member of the house or are they a guild bank representative or are they a broker you know what what are their main functions they could also be an independent agent so you know they will go to different houses as needed basically then we have new space and guild archetypes so we got the Guild Engineer. His trait is being a Guild Engineer. Primary skill, understand. Secondary skill, discipline. With focuses in advanced technology and spaceship technology. As the talent school under pressure and putting theory into practice. Their drives, they know that the jobs of keeping the fleet operational and expanding it are of paramount importance. They also put tremendous faith into the technology they work with every day. We got the Guild Financier. Trait is being Guild Financier. They are primary skill to understand. Secondary skill, communicate. Focuses in finance and Guild bureaucracy. Their talents are checking the books and methodical efficiency. And they're dedicated to the numbers that drive the Imperium. They make judgments based on reason and experience, but often they need to follow their faith about how the market will play out. Like all guild agents, their duty to the guild is vitally important, but they do their best to temper that with justice to keep the market balanced. Then we have guild inspectors. So they are root administrators, tariff collectors, or some other bureaucrat. However, there are some field agents who also need to have this methodical efficiency. They examine cargo, investigate craft sites, perform field analyses, and so forth. Their traits is guild inspector, primary skill communicate, secondary skill understand. They have focuses in deductive reasoning and finance, talents methodical efficiency, and a no for cargo. Her drives are getting to the truth as the number one purpose. Some inspectors perform their job with the additional desire to see that justice is maintained and that no one is taking advantage of the guild or its representatives. We also have the guild scientist. While they've been doing the, pretty much the same thing the same way for thousands of years, they do have need for innovation as well. So guild scientists can travel the universe to study just about anything. So as such, their primary skill is understand, which makes sense. Secondary skill is communicate. And they have their focuses in mathematics and physics or other kind of sciences. They have talents, intense study, and power of neutrality. They believe believe that the uh, scientific method is the best way to arrive at the truth, which is their goal. For some, this goal is only a milestone on their way to their ultimate target, the power that such knowledge can grant. We also have Guild Scouts. These are explorers sent out into the known universe. They seek out newly discovered planets or cosmic phenomena to understand the universe and its hazards. Their primary skill is move. Secondary skill is battle. They focus on piloting spaceship and space navigation. They have talents of the power of neutrality and rapid maneuvering. And their drives are exploring the universe and documenting important finds is a duty the Guild Scouts take seriously. Many have strong faith that their searches will be worthwhile no matter how far off course they may wander. Then we have Guild Spies. These are specially trained agents performing the dangerous work of infiltrating the territory, installations, and even house of other factions to gain intelligence for the spacing guild. So the primary skills communicate, secondary skills battle, focuses in espionage and infiltration, they have the talents of code of secrecy, play both ends against the middle. It takes an agent feels a strong duty toward their guild to take the risks that are common in a spy's job. This assignment can also fill such operatives with a feeling of power, knowing that anyone's secrets are there for the taking. Then we have some new focuses as well for guild characters. These are new focus options, especially suited to spacing space and guild characters. So bribery, falling under communicate, finance, under understand, fold space navigation. So that's only available to guild navigators. So if you need to make, to stat one of those up, there you go. Guild bureaucracy. So that's an understand focus for knowing how space and guild operates. Low gravity operation. So working in low G or microgravity. Mathematics. So the study of numbers, quantities, formulas, and spaces. Key to the guild language, piloting a spaceship, so controlling and maneuvering a standard non-fold space-capable spacecraft, but that does not enable the operation of a hayliner. They have a secret language, knowledge of the higher order mathematical language spoken only by guild navigators. That's interesting. Space navigation, determining where you are and how to get somewhere else using traditional non-fold space interplanetary navigation. You can have a focus on space tactics for battle, knowledge of combat involving spacecraft, spaceship technology, Understand, knowing how to construct or repair spaceships, spaceship weapons, use of weapons on spaceships, obviously, and stunners, effective use of stunner weapons commonly used by guild agents. We've got some new talent, so code of secrecy. Any attempt to get you to reveal confidential information about a client is one difficulty level higher, even if it's torture. Guild peace, for the cost of one momentum, you may add the trait guild peace to a scene, reminding all those present of the power of the guild. It will penalize violent actions. Guild upbringing, when you step aboard a guild hayliner or leave a planetary atmosphere, you gain one momentum. Methodical efficiency, when making an understanding te- test that applies to finance, commerce, or bureaucracy, you may re-roll one of the d20s in your pool. 
minor splice mutation. So you gain the trait mutated that may not be removed to represent this minor deformity. The nature of it is for you to detail. However, you have gained a special relationship with spice. When you use a spice talent, you may reroll 1d20. You may also consume a spice asset to gain the benefits of having spent determination on the test, but only once per game session. Notice for cargo, when you attempt a skill test to detect contraband or locate a specific item or substance in a collection of cargo, you reduce the difficulty by 1 to a minimum of 0. You can also play both ends against the middle. When you're involved in a, as a neutral party in a conflict between two other parties, you may spend four momentum from the group pool to gain one point of determination if you do not currently have any. You can only do that once per scene. Power of neutrality. If you're recognizably a guild agent, enemies must spend two momentum or threat to attack you or move against you directly in a physical challenge. If you accept a duel or make an attack, you lose this advantage. Space power. This talent adds access to a guild-only asset, a hayliner. You don't command it and can't compel it to appear, but unlike any other member of a house, you have the means of requesting one and directing it to transport you in whatever assets you require. The game master is the ultimate arbiter of its availability. You have spacing talent. So while in zero-g or light gravity environments, even in artificial gravity, you may reroll one. 1d20 for any move test. Finally, the cylinder must get through. When taking actions directly related to delivering a message you've been tasked with, you may re-roll a single d20 in your dice pool. You may also spend determination on such, on such tasks regardless of whether your belief statement applies to the test. Useful. Then we have some details about traveling universe. So this is more technical stuff about how you book a journey with the guild. It's a straightforward process for most denizens of the Imperium. So you pay the guild bank on every world. The Hayliners have regular transit routes, and each spaceport has a kiosk to facilitate booking passage. They have standard rates for passenger travel for economy, luxury, and private travel. Further, rates for bulk transport, secure transport, and extremely expensive military transport are also standardized. The massive Hayliner ships themselves can move instantaneously from any one point in the universe to another thanks to the compressed instability of the guild navigators. The transport is completely safe. The journey itself is unnoticeable to all passengers and, and has no known material effect on anything aboard the Hayliner. One moment you're here, the next moment you're there. Pretty amazing. Most of the transit time is the delay of loading and offloading passengers and cargo. So each transit point will have its own set of circumstances and different times to unload depending on what kind of facilities they have. Only two houses manufacture guild hayliners at this time, House Ix and House Riches. The ships made by House Ix are generally considered to be of higher quality, but there's pressure from Chom and the Landsrider to retire this newest design. As this hayliner is larger and taxes are based on each journey, not the volume of cargo, Chom feels being cheated of his due. That's interesting. So nobody knows the number of hayliners in service, and they keep that information secret. Some have been in service for thousands of years, retrofitted to maintain service as time and use wears them down. All hayliners are equipped with defensive shields, anti-gravity generators, and communication systems. All ships must deactivate any shield while well inside, as even those of a small ship can disastrously disrupt this full space field. Of course, they carry both passengers and cargo. Typically, a hairline will have a set route and spend hours, sometimes days, at each stop while goods are unloaded and new goods are loaded. So, the Emperor, the Guild, Chome, and all the houses earn most of their income from these routes. Traveling without the Guild. Okay. So, in the era before Guild Navigator, space travel was slow and dangerous. One in ten ships attempting FTL travel either crashed into space debris or simply disappeared from the known universe. Okay. Journeying below light speed would take years to reach even the closest star systems and travel in the galaxy thousands of years without space folding. Travel anywhere in the known universe is for the most part beyond the reach of even FTL travel. Myths of generational ships out there still traversed in the starways still abound, but most have also passed beyond human memory. Most houses have extensive space fleets well equipped for travel inside their star systems, but beyond that you need a highliner. House Waku. So this was a major house at one point, obliterated in a third coal sack war and forbidden from setting foot on any imperial world by the Padisha Emperor. For undisclosed reasons, the guild offered the house sanctuary and life aboard the Hayliners, but as a subservient caste. So for many generations, the house is only known in existence aboard the guild ships. So the house seems content to serve the guild for now in the niche the universe has made for them. They serve the guild ships as vendors, stevedores, servants, janitors, and other staff working in the restaurants, casinos, and hotels of the passenger ships the guild operates. Uh, the guild prefer House Waku to handle those tasks, freeing up their own staff to run the ships for maintenance and serve the navigators directly. And then we have a little sidebar here on playing as House Waku. There may be an opportunity to create a campaign. You know, Waku could be a spy for the guild or a free agent for a hire or even spying on the guild itself. A false identity is required to be able to travel into the Imperium because they can't set foot on any Imperial world. For us, an organization the size and extent of the guild, such identification is not difficult to obtain, but if you're found out, they'll execute you. So... Be careful. Variant hayliners. So these are stuff of legend, rumor, and purely hypothetical conjecture. So there's the armed hayliner. This is considered a distinct possibility. Great care needs to be taken with the military implications of such a craft that could instantaneously travel to anywhere in the known universe and project a fearsome arsenal. An armed hayliner could easily carry an impressive invasion force and even have atomics as part of the available firepower. The political ramifications would change the Imperium and disrupt the balance of power. Hence, the guild avoids development of such a craft. 
Colony hayliner is another speculative design. They may well have specialized hayliners for exploration and colonization, which would be prudent for the guild to have other hidden worlds, such as Junction and systems other than Tupal as sanctuaries and redoubts, should developments go badly for them in the Imperium. And since they're the only ones with the ships to do it, might as well. There's also courier hayliners. Guild Highlanders are locked into regular routes, so the guild maintains a few smaller fold space vessels for off-book travel. So this is used for guild business they want to keep secret, such as collecting illegal spice bribes from Fremen and transporting agents across the known universe to do their bidding. They're also used as fast couriers and message transports. Pretty cool. I didn't know about that, actually. I'm sure it was mentioned in the setting, and I was just too useless. Now we have a little bit of some cool stuff on creating planets. If you want to neat, quickly create a random world, this is the way to do it. So you, there's 20 different types of planets, from uninhabitable gas giants and abandoned volcanic planets to mineral-rich asteroids and Earth-like planets, if you get a 20. The political affiliation, so they could be under the direct control of House Carino. They could be under the control of Great House, Major House, Minor House, or other various houses of different types. Or they could be Outsiders no political affiliation. Then you roll up their level of military power, so uh, what kind of forces they have, if they have police forces, planetary defense, space fleets, and whether they're major or minor in strength. You can roll for their population and lifestyle, so they have a massive population with agrarian culture, trade wealth, mining, smelting, mixed businesses, military training, reserves and hunting, religious planets, smuggling outposts, imperial outposts, small villages, and then they have some uh, example planets here. So this is House Nagara's home city of Kyotachi is set up on this planet. House Nagar, as you might recall, is the house in the Agents of Doom box set. Now we have the real meat of this supplement, which is managing our house. You see a really impressive tableau here of a very busy house operating here. We've got multiple hayliners in the sky. We've got ornithopters. We've got huge things being built. We've got massive trucks and cargo trains carrying stuff around. Loads going on. So, house management, how often you want to use it is the first thing you need to decide with amongst your group. So, basically, each session of house management is assumed to take place once each game year. So, I mean, you don't have to do it that often. Keep in mind that the more often you run a house management session, the quicker the house will progress. So, that could screw with your long-term campaign planning if you want the gold for, you know, for the players to be the advancement of their house along with the complications that come with that. So, house has different features that define it. So, of course, there's the domains, which are their business interests and form the basis for the holding resources they have. They have their wealth, which is the representation of the finances of investments. Each point of wealth represents thousands of salaries. Resources, so that's things like workers, materials, and construction expertise. And their holdings, as territories, facilities, and infrastructure. Boons, so these are bits of favor and goodwill you have with other powers and factions in the Imperium. So they are, you know, something the house needs to have, but they're more ephemeral. Ventures, so to build new facilities and gain new boons, you have to make an investment in time, wealth, and resources. So ventures are the projects that lead to that. And then finally, you have the status, which is the relative power and influence of the house, distinct from its wealth. So if a high status is well regarded by the Landstrad or the major house it owes fealty to, but if the status is too high, it could create jealousy and fear amongst your peers. So the rhythm of play, each house management session follows some certain steps. So first you get news from the Imperium, which is optional, but if there's anything interesting happening in the wider Imperium in the past year, particularly anything happening with other minor houses uh, or neighboring houses, or any rumors of stuff happening, that could happen uh, and be talked about here by the GM. Then you work out your income, so you receive a quantity of resource and wealth points defined by your domains. You could have a role to see if the house gains an opportunity or suffers a crisis during this session. Then you do upkeep, so you need to spend some of your fortune to maintain certain aspects of your house or allow them to fade and reallocate funds. You can pursue any ventures, so there's building facilities and gaining boons. Perform up to two ventures, but can buy more if you have enough wealth. Finally, you do end of year and downtime stuff, so any unspent resources and wealth may be stockpiled. Players can also detail what their characters have been up to and undertake personal ventures. That's cool. So house statistics. So house doesn't act like a character, but has many resources and agents that might be under the command of the player characters. So house actions are always done at arc as architect level play as represent the player character leading the actions of a vast array of resources and agents. So house's skills are the same as those for characters and work in the same way but what they represent is different. So you have battle but here it's the military power of the house. Communicate is a measure of the house's diplomatic reputation and the favors it is owed. Discipline is the loyalty of the people and forces at its command so it's useful. Move is the measure of a house's response time for crises not just weapons of war but also diplomacy and then understand is the level of academic excellence you can rely on that could be arts and crafts and also scientific research. So determining your house starting skills this you can just pick an array based on what type of house you are you know you assign them as you see fit to those boxes basically non-player character houses and drives so houses don't have drives non-player houses will have a drive that will be determined by the game master so they should determine how much the other ho house hates the player character's house which should have been done during house creation so it's this hatred that determines what rating should be used for the drive if their hatred is ambivalent it's only four if it's conley 
then it's 8. So it's not important which drive the house is using, however. In this case, the stat can be treated much like the single drive score used by minor supporting characters. You can parcel it out more in a defined way if you want, but that's optional. Let me give a nice example here. So House Malay is a house minor known for poetry and assassination. So as a minor house, they put battle and communicate at 6, discipline at 7, move at 5, and understanding at 4. Their enemy, House Arcturi, loathes them due to a difference in morality. Unless they are facing a specific character, House Arcturi actions use a drive of 6, usually based on faith. You know, states and reputation. So, depending on the type of house you have, you'll have a different level of status, and it'll give you a sort of house type. So, if you're feeble, you're basically flying solo and have no allies. Any attempt to secure new allies or make an aggressive action suffers a two step difficulty penalty. So, for a minor house, that means you have 0 to, 0 to 10 status, major 0 to 20, great house 0 to 40. If you're weak, taking a few knocks, but you still have friends. So, again, it varies depending from minor to major to great. So, from there, you can go to respected. So, you're basically no penalties or modifiers for anything you want to do. If you're strong, uh, difficulty for house actions reduce difficulty by one step, as other houses are hesitant to stand in your way. Problematic. So <laughs> that's interesting. You go from strong to problematic uh, is the next step. If you get too much status, then you'll be getting too ambitious, and the emperor or the great houses may view you as stretching your influence a little bit too far, getting a little uh, ambitious above your station. But the house is trying to make aggressive actions as the difficulty is reduced by two steps as nobody wants to stand in your way, but partnerships are starting to look decidedly unequal, making attempts to gain favor or an alliance suffer a one-step difficulty penalty, and other houses are discussing what might have to be done about you. Any house action or venture the house undertakes generates one threat for the GM. That's cool. Finally, you could be dangerous. You're doing far too well for itself and clearly have designs on the resources and power of those above it. Other peers and maybe even the emperor could be applauding your downfall, but nobody's quite ready to challenge you yet. The house reduces any aggressive or threatening action difficulty by two steps, but has a two-step penalty to all diplomatic actions and attempts. Any house action or venture the house performs also generates two threat. That's really cool. Again, it, it shows, you know, how your fortunes can turn. As you become more successful, you gain more enemies. <laughs> Things can be easier in one sense. You can move more might and power around the the known universe, but your diplomatic status will change. People will be concerned about your rise to power. And they give you a guideline for starting status for each of the uh, categories of house you can start with. So reputation, this is governing what the house is known for. So this is your house's traits, basically. The higher the status, the more highly its skill in an area is regarded. There's no need for a separate reputation rating, since your reputation is defined by the traits of the house. But the higher your status is, the more likely you'll be regarded as an expert in that field. So for example, they use house Harkonnens. They're, they're brutal. Some other houses are also brutal, but the Harkonnens are so brutal and so high status that they're considered the most brutal of everybody. Then we have domains. So these can be planetary scale. So that's when you're dealing with uh, major houses or great houses. Great houses can have more than one world, of course. The size of your domain gives you a certain number of spaces to have your ventures and your holdings on. So if you're a nascent house, you only have 10 spaces, so a small area of land on the planet of the house major that you serve. If you're a minor house, you have 35 spaces, so it's around a third to a half of a planet or an independent small moon, which again will be administrated on behalf of the house major. A major house will have 60 spaces, so at least most of an entire planet. And a great house will have two planets or at least one planet and several moons. 100 spaces. So there's a huge difference as you move up the ladder as far as how much you can cultivate and how many ventures you can go after. So then we get into um, recording your domains. So there's this new sheet here, which we see a small version of. Your starting domains. Each primary domain the house controls requires 25 spaces to manage, and each secondary domain requires 10 spaces to manage. Growing a domain to 10 or 25 spaces doesn't make it a secondary or primary domain in its own right. Along with the space required, you also need to have a long history of clever business decisions and savvy market planning to create their position in the trading empire. Gaining holdings just ensures a decent supply of the produce in question. Turning that into a primary or secondary domain is one of many ventures you can do. Recording domains, so you simply mark off the spaces required for any domains the house controls without additional bookkeeping, but ideally players should detail a little more about the nature of the facilities the domains require. So, for example, machinery, you'll need an industrial domain that could be highly polluted. Produce, you'll need some kind of farming land. Conley might require laboratories, as well as science, espionage, you need interrogation facilities, all that kind of stuff. Expertise generally requires training in academic institutions. Workers need a mixture of produce and expertise, so you need training facilities and somewhere to live. Understanding is purely academic, but you'll need... Obviously, universities, research, academic facilities, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're doing research in pharmaceuticals, you'll need vast fields of plants to experiment with, that kind of thing. And then you have a worksheet 
uh, the worksheet for tracking houses and domains. So the contents of each space can be simply listed with the total amount of spaces for the specific planet or moon. But if you're using graph paper or a hex grid, the players can take time to map out the planet artistically in more detail with each hex representing a space, which sounds like a lot more fun to me. So then uh, there are several different roles within a house to keep it running. Player character's house may have a ruler and heirs at creation. In addition to this, the players may also pick a number of other roles to be filled during house creation. Remember that some roles like advisor can be picked multiple times. It gives you, you know, if you have a nascent house, you only have two additional roles. Minor will have four. Major will have six. Great will have eight. Roles that aren't filled will still have somebody doing that job in some respect. That's one thing they point out here. So the roles include the ruler. We have the consort. They can inspire the ruler of the air, granting two additional momentum to use on house skill test during house management. All house tests increase the difficulty by one step, by the way, if there's no ruler. So that's the importance that they have. Each advisor should pick a skill and a focus, and they can add one extra d20 to any house skill test using that skill, even if they don't make the test themselves. If their focus also applies, it may be applied to the role. Uh, the chief physician has the trait trusted. For any member of the house, all troops are at plus one quality, maximum four, when defending in a contested action, as they're generally fitter and in better shape. Counselor can give house skill tests using discipline and can have a focus applied to it. If you have an envoy, they reduce the difficulty of any single communicate test with another house or faction during house management by one step. So they are skilled at smoothing ruffled diplomatic feathers. The heir is there to basically instantly take control of a house as the ruler when the ruler disappears and is killed or, or whatever. A marshal reduces crime and makes people feel safer and gains an extra resource point for every marshal that is in the house. A scholar reduces the difficulty of any scientific or academic research project by one step. Any test of scientific or academic nature using the house skill of understand adds an extra d20. That's pretty cool. A spy master gives you all espionage attempts against the house increases difficulty by one step. The sword master, they pick two weapons they've been training the house soldiers in. All of them are considered to have a focus in both those weapons. And they're always con close enough to the house's ruler to provide protection as a bodyguard as long as they're on the same planet. Uh, if the ruler and heir are in different areas, the sword master must choose which to protect. A treasurer adds plus 10 wealth to the house at each house management session due to their shrewd investments. Up to five treasurers can be employed by the house to manage a truly extensive portfolio of investments. A house with a war master, finally, commanding an attack or defense, begin the conflict with a momentum, momentum pool of four. So then we have the steps of house management. So news from the Imperium. This is the optional bit, but it's quite good for setting flavor. So they give you some examples of things that would be important. You know, rival or allied house might have a new heir. Marriage would mean an alliance or a joining of two houses. There could be a death of a ruler making a house weak or the death of noted advisors or mentats in other houses could be important. The GM's toolkit has random events as well that can be used as news. And then players can also create rumors. So even quite outlandish ones like the Bene Tillilax have sent a master to Arrakis for some purpose. The events table on page 99 from the events phase may also be used by the players or game masters as a source of rumors. The GM is the arbiter of whether the rumor is true, misleading, or false. That's kind of fun. Next, the second phase is income generation. So primary generation of income is from the primary domain, and they produce resources and wealth as listed here. A secondary domain generates wealth as listed in this table. So generally, it's half of the value of the primary domain in resources and wealth. Optionally, this can be modified by the type of domain. So artistic, espionage, political, and religious domains produce fewer resources and more wealth, while farming, industrial, kindly, military, and scientific domains produce more resources. You can also spend some time selling your resources to generate wealth or import resources resources at great expense. So you can use up one of your ventures for that round of house management, but only for either converting wealth to resources or vice versa. To do both costs two ventures, but it's rarely necessary to do that. So with trade, each three wealth spent gains one resource, or each one resource spent gains three wealth. No more than a third of your current wealth resources can be traded in this way unless you have a spaceport. Then we have events. So here we have a couple of tables that we can roll on here. So during any session of house management, the unexpected might occur. So you roll a d20, consulting the column that applies to the house's current status level. So you roll a d20, and you consult here. If you roll an opportunity, that's good. If you roll a crisis, that's bad. And the higher up the scale you are, basically, you're more much more likely to have an event happen during this phase. So opportunities include things like archaeological finds, diplomatic overtures, an economic boom, justice prevails. So a, a major espionage operation has been uncovered, something like that. You get some new subjects or convenient misfortune, which happens to a rival house. That's cool. If you get a crisis, maybe somebody tries to assassinate one of the PCs. There's bandit activity. Some other house declares a kindly. You could have espionage f happening against you, smugglers, or an inconvenient fortune where you roll an opportunity and that happens to a rival house instead of you. That's cool. So then we have the upkeep phase. So there's five options to use to spend your wealth on. You can spend on military power. So if you don't spend anything, you have no defensive force whatsoever beyond some militias and ceremonial guards. If you spend five wealth on your militia, then you have a mostly ceremonial army with good personal weapons, but they can't defend the planet. For a full-on ground defense, you need to spend an upkeep of 10. Planetary defense is 20, so you 
can have a large army and a moderate space fleet to defend the planet in orbit as well. An assault force means you have a vast army and space fleet, meaning you can also leave to attack somebody else and still defend the home world. If you have an invasion fleet, wealth upkeep of 50, difficulty of 5, you have a gigantic fleet capable of protecting several planets and holdings. So it's comparable to the Carino's Imperial Fleet. Thanks. Where it says difficulty here in the military power section, that means that when you have a warfare conflict, the base difficulty will be defined by the, the size of the defense force that you upkeep. So population loyalty gives you a bonus or penalty to the base difficulty of actions requiring the support of the population, which is most construction ventures, basically. So if everybody hates you because you don't spend any money on them, they might loathe you. So the loyalty modifier will be plus or minus one. Acceptance. So there's no loyalty modifier at that level. Just basic. Everything's normal-ish. If people appreciate you, then you, your loyalty modifier will be plus or minus one. If they love you, wealth will keep 40, then you get a loyalty modifier plus or minus two. The plus comes from when somebody's trying to do espionage and stuff like that against your house. Because your population is loyal, it's harder for them to do so. The minus is modifying the difficulty of ventures that need population approval. Lifestyle. So this is the lifestyle of your house. If you don't do anything, you live like commoners and you gain the commoner's trait. You can be poor and gain the poor trait. So you have personal weapons and items, but no advanced technology. You can live in luxury as a noble. You can put on a show of wealth, but your daily lives are fairly typical. If you're wealthy, wealth could be 30. You can afford almost anything you want and the best quality. Agents are provided with anything up to and including vehicles, and the game master may allow any of these items to be quality one, and you gain the impressive trait. If you're imperial, wealth keep 60 you rival the emperor for luxury and spectacle most of the house's peers seethe with jealousy gain the envy trait then you have your house skills so these also cost wealth to maintain no house skill can be maintained above rating of 10 which costs 24 wealth a house can choose not to spend the wealth to upkeep a particular skill and if you don't spend the upkeep for a skill the value of that skill drops by one point permanently you can improve it later on but then you won't have any bonus for having previously been at the prior level so and they need to pay upkeep for your house roles like your advisors, chief physicians, your sword masters, war masters, etc. If they're Benny Gesserit trained as well, you need to add plus five wealth to the normal cost. So then we have the ventures. So these are not always going to be successful or completed in a single session. They can run to problems. They can take longer. They could require bribes or stuff like that. So you try to complete a venture using two D20, but up to three more D20s can be purchased for the test at a cost of five, 10, and 15 wealth, the same way that momentum is spent for extra dice. So this represents putting additional funds into the project to increase its speed or hiring the best or fasting more people. The cost of each venture must be paid before any dice are rolled and the wealth is spent whether the test is successful or not. The target number is made up of the appropriate house skill and the most appropriate drive of the player character taking the lead on the project. It's up to the players which character leads the project, but each player character can only lead one venture during each house management session. Each venture requires a certain number of successes to be gained on the test to be successful. If it's unsuccessful, but you got at least one success, the number of successes required is reduced by one for the remainder of the project, so long as it is attempted on the next session as well. No matter how many successes are earned, an unfinished venture must be started anew if it's not continued during the immediate next house management session. Two or more of the same type of venture may be worked on at the same time, but multiple attempts cannot be made to attempt exactly the same venture. And then we have a list of ventures you can do. So you can expand your domain. If you have unused spaces, you can just build there. But if you don't have that, you can use wealth and profits to change the land to something usable. You could maybe terraform the deserts, build artificial islands, reclaim waste sites, create satellite bases, or whatever. Each planet is assumed to have an extra 20 spaces, or 10 on a moon, that require some sort of environmental management to suit either exploitation or housing. Clearing new space is a venture, but is costly and time-consuming. If the house is running out of space, it can appeal to the emperor to take control of more territory. A minor house might be able to request more territory to control from their house major. This has its own risks, as most houses major are wary of their vassals gaining too much power. A house with no space, one that does not want to work to clear space, can over-industrialize currently held spaces. Doing this assumes the house is either relocating population to smaller accommodation or destroying green or open spaces that makes the whole area much more unpleasant to live in. They don't cost any more, but make the population more unhappy and prone to unrest, so that's what happened on Katie Prime. Uh, you can often lose the domain as well. It can be worthwhile, because it's often worth having a few more domain facilities than a house needs for its domains as a production project activity quickly loses customers. If a primary domain is reduced to 20 facilities, it becomes a secondary domain. If a secondary domain drops to 8 facilities, it loses its status as a secondary domain. Once these facilities are rebuilt, the house can attempt to upgrade the area of expertise to domain status again, but it is no easier than starting again as trade of the Imperium is unforgiving. 
So we have our construction ventures here. This is all the stuff that you can build. So claiming domain tells you for each of these ventures, you know, the resources you need to expend, the skill that's required, and the success is required. So claiming domain, you need uh, for a secondary domain, you want 12 resources, communicate skill, and five successes. For a primary, you need to spend uh, 24 resources, use the understanding skill, and have five successes. So because of the number of successes needed, you're probably going to need to spend several upkeep phases claiming a domain. So it's quite a costly and time-consuming thing to do. Domain facility. So this is something that you use to produce your goods for your main domains. They cost five resources and have a variable skill. So it depends on what your specialism is, which skill you're going to roll against for your house characteristics. You only need one, one success, so it's pretty easy to build these uh, in a given year. Expanding a state. You use the understanding skill and everything else is variable, so you can develop it in different ways. A, stylish appointed, a stylishly appointed estate would be 12 resources and two successes. Successes. Luxurious apartment is 16 resources and three successes, which is a step above. Diplomatic tests made by the host have difficulty reduced by one. Palatial appointment is 20 resource, resources and four successes. Each of these requires the previous one as a prerequisite. So a palatial appointment, you, you actually could have the emperor visit. They're of high enough standard. And diplomatic tests made by the host have difficulty reduced by two steps. And you could also have an escape system with 20 resources and four successes. Uh, so you have a series of tunnels, secret doors, or panic rooms that reduce the difficulty of any escape actions by two steps in the event of a siege or invasion. You can also expand your land with discipline, six resources, and one success, so that's taming the untamed wilderness. You can have a festival with two resources and the communicate skill, and you don't need any successes for this. Just something you do to, you know, bread and circuses for your people. Fortifications, you use discipline, and there's two different types. Standard fortifications, resources four, successes one, you get one fortification asset in the area. Enhanced fortifications, you need the standard already, then you pay eight resources and one success, and you now have two fortification assets. Great monument, you need eight resources, discipline, skill, and three successes. So you're honoring past vic victories or noted heroes of the house. Each carries the impressive trait. You'd have a hidden area for 10 resources, a roll against understanding, and four successes. So it's an area that's been disguised or hidden to avoid the detection of a facility. So it could be done for military facilities or secret spy stores or stuff like that. You can industrialize a space as well. So you can build a second holding on an occupied space by cramming the population or facilities together or even on top of each other. The population loyalty is considered one level lower in that area. That takes two resources, discipline, and two successes. Military base, two resources, battle, and zero successes. So very easy to build. They're standardized. But then you can develop them. So you can develop defenses into command bunkers, garrisons. So if you have a warfare scene, you have a command bunker asset. If you have a command bunker, you have a garrison, you have an infantry asset, and you have can have up to four garrisons in a single facility. A landing pad gives you two ornithopters, and as many as four landing pads may be added to a facility. If you add sentry posts, get plus one to the difficulty of any attempt to move covertly in this space or holding. You can have a shield, add one shield asset during warfare scenes, but they can't be moved or attacked while active. A shuttle platform, so you get a spacecraft the side of a, sh a shuttle that can be landed here. No shuttle is provided. Any larger ship must land at a full spaceport. You can have a vehicle bay, which gives you a tank unit asset. You can have up to four in a single facility. And then you do mines, 10 resources, discipline, and two successes. Orbital facilities need 10 resources, understanding, and three successes. So this is to construct orbital facilities um, that can be used like any other spaces. Further spaces can be added to the facility, or they can be considered new space stations. You can have a planetary feature, resources four, skill, discipline, successes one. Minor statues, facilities, and landscaping projects that gain no benefit but add to the setting of the player character house. Pleasure District, 10 resources, understanding, and two successes, provides entertainment for the local people and reduces the cost of population loyalty by one wealth. You can build a spaceport, so that needs 10 resources, understanding, and three successes. Properly equipped port allows spaceships to refuel efficiently and have their goods disseminated more efficiently. A transit system, four resources, skill of move, successes one. Links areas by way of railroad or air. Pick four specific spaces on the planet, and these are now considered linked for purposes of movement. A multiple transit system can be built to create a transport network across the planet. Any single space may be linked into up to five transit systems. That's cool. Storage facilities, so two resources, discipline, and zero successes needed. These are just to store resources, and you can build many silos. Basically, allows you to store more resources at the end of house management. You need those, or your resources will ebb away at the end of your... Um, house management phase. So major and great houses, you'll begin with a few additional holdings. So you'll have a stylish appointment, standard fortification and shield as a major house, standard fortification for four other areas, and a hidden area for storage of 10 resources. A great house estate will have a luxurious appointment, enhanced fortification, shield, and landing pad, standard fortification to eight other areas, hidden area for 20 resources, and a spaceport. Then we have our boon ventures. So this is the stuff which is the intangible assets you need to cultivate. So bulk enemy, wealth five, skill, battle, successes one. So you use 
use some time to stymie the actions of your enemy houses and curtail the activity. So until the next house management session, it costs the game master three threat rather than one to bring an enemy house to a scene. Oh, that's very useful. Bene Gesserit Alliance, Wealth 10, Skill Discipline, four successes. All difficulties to test made against a Bene Gesserit agent are reduced by one step until the next house management session. You'd have a Chome Agreement, Wealth 5, Skill Communicate, successes two. One of your domains gets an extra 10 wealth next session. Chome Influenced, Wealth 10, Skill Communicate, successes three. Gain an influential position within Chome. You can use this influence to gain additional success on any trade negotiation, but you can only use that once. Cultivate Initiative, Wealth 10, Skill Understand, successes two. The house's staff and personnel are encouraged to speak their mind. All minor supporting characters created in the next adventure have the bold talent, affecting one skill chosen when the supporting character is created. Cool. You can cultivate obedience, wealth 10, skill understand, success is 2, so this gives supporting characters the cautious talent. Cultivate unity. At the beginning of the next adventure, the momentum pool starts at a minimum of 3. You can enlist an ally with a wealth of 20, skill communicate, success is 3. The player can spend one momentum to bring this allied house into a scene in the same way the game master can spend threat to do the same with an enemy house. You can establish a reputation, wealth 20, skill communicate, success is 3. So you work to ensure a certain reputation that they have built becomes permanent. This can only be applied to a specific house trait that has been maintained at least three house management sessions concurrently. So the game master may also insist the house perform some act that epitomizes its reputation to fix it in the minds of the Lancerat. Once successful, this trait becomes a permanent house trait. Wow, cool. You can gain the favor of the Bene Gesserit with Wealth 10, Skull Discipline, Success is 1. So you can call in a favor with the BGs and gain one additional success on any test. But you can only use that boon once. You can gain the favor of the Spacing Guild, so that enhances your ability to trade goods between worlds. You can add an additional success to any test made with a guild agent of any form, but it only works once. You can fill a house role with Wealth 25, Skill Understand, Success 1, so you employ an expert to perform one of the house roles that's currently unoccupied. You can fill it with a Mentat for an additional 10 Wealth charge on top of that. You can fund a Discovery, Wealth 30, Skill Moves, Success 4, so the house assists the guild in locating new planets worth colonizing or exploiting in the galaxy. The funds are useful, but are really a bribe for the guild to give this information to the house first. Gain reputation. So you spend time and resources trying to spread rumors about the reputation and goals to build its name. So until the next management session, you gain a new house trait. So if you can ma maintain this three times in succession, as mentioned before, then you'll make that trait permanent, which is cool. You also spend 50 wealth to gain territory if a new planet is discovered. So the house must therefore be considered in the Emperor's favor and have successfully helped the guild discover a new planet in this house management session. If the house is successful, they gain control of a new planet with an amount of empty spaces determined by the Game Master. Well, that's huge. That's tough, though. You need a lot of things in place for that happen. You can have a guild alliance, so it's a temporary thing, wealth 10, skill moves, success is 4, so your goals line up with the guild for the moment. All difficulties to test made against the guild age of any form are reduced by one step until the next session. You can get a Hayliner Charter. At great expense, wealth 40, specifically, it's skill moves, success is 2, the house is paid to divert a guild Hayliner on a direct route of their choice. The house will move any non-military assets to any other planet instantly, establishing them before the start of any new adventure. Military assets may be, may be moved at additional cost by combining this with another venture. See, Warfare. Humanitarian aid, wealth 20, skill moves, success is 3. The house provides food and aid to another beleaguered house in need. This gains them support for their charitable efforts, adding plus 2 to their status. You also gain the temporary trait charitable. You can improve your skills, so you invest the equipment and personnel to increase one of the house's skills, but it costs an awful lot. So if your current skill level is 4, you got to pay 20, it's difficulty 2. If you want to go to 8, you got to spend 60 and 5. So yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. Uh, you can mount an invasion. The amount it costs varies. You need the battle skill, of course, and you need 1 success. Success, but it's 10 wealth per unit that you get involved in the invasion, so it's very expensive. And then you have to prepare for war as well, so if you want to do that, you spend 30 wealth, two successes in battle, and you spend some time developing better defensive strategies and fortifying or planning an invasion. On a successful test for the next warfare conflict, the house engages in momentum pool begins at maximum of six. You can also reduce your status voluntarily. You can take a back seat in landslide politics to reduce their status, and your status is modified by minus one for every success on the test to a maximum of minus five. However, if it's a failure, you gain three status, and also gain one status for every complication rolled. In this case, you've been so quiet that other houses are wondering what you're up to. You can rattle your saber, flex your military power with a wealth of ten, skill battle, and three successes. So you don't outright attack, but you intimidate your peers, adding two to their status. You also gain the temporary trait aggressive, which again, you could choose to maintain and make that a permanent trait eventually if you want. You could have a secret store for 10 wealth uh, using your discipline and four successes. They could be uh, storing something secretly on behalf of another house. Could be spice, atomics, or a spy, or a criminal 
or whatever. If the test is successful, the item is hidden until the next house management session, and the player characters are remunerated with 10 extra wealth or 5 extra resources. If the test fails, the item is discovered and the house gains the trait criminal until the next session and loses one status point. They will also suffer a difficulty penalty of one step in all dealings with the house they have failed. Ouch. Alright, so that's all your ventures, and then at the end of the year you do your downtime. So at the end of the year you keep stock of your house holdings and funds. Only 10 resources can be kept stockpiled unless you have storage facilities. Wealth doesn't need to be stored. There's no limit to that. But if the household has... If the house has 20 or more wealth, it can become a target for thieves, crooked investors, and envious rivals. You can choose to roll 1d20 at the start of the next session and apply the following result to any stored wealth. Then you can do personal ventures. So these are things that players can do, and they should create a narrative about how they do this. So they require a certain skill test against a certain difficulty. However, they use only the player's skills and drives. So the player group may have one momentum per player character in the pool. It is up to the player character as a group to decide who gets to spend this momentum and on what, though. So with this, you can do things like affirming your allegiance with an allied house, gaining the trait friend of X. You can get combat training, pick up a weapon they've been training with, and may consider its quality one point higher, maximum four. You can craft an item, difficulty two to four. If you make at least two successes, you gain a new asset of a particular type of machine of your choice. If you have four successes, you get a quality of four. That's cool. You can create a composition. So you can create an artistic composition with your communicate skill. For every additional success, the character goes beyond the first. The work of art gains one level of quality. You can develop a contact with communicate. So you take the time to build up a new contact in an area of their choice. You should give the contact a name and specify yeah, the, what planet they can be found on and what house or faction they are a part of. Your new contact asset for the player. A failed test means the contact still doesn't trust you. You can heal a complication. So you undertake a physical or mental fitness regime to remove a problematic complication. And if you're successful with only one difficulty, the complication is removed. Skill training. You can spend some time honing a particular skill, which will be the active one for the skill test. With at least one success, once in the next adventure, they may choose to add an extra d D20 to any skill check using this particular skill. You can monitor your enemies, so you spy an enemy house or faction. If you're successful, you may add either a single D20 to the next test they make against that enemy, or may ask the game master one question about their plans. Complications gained from the test alert the enemy to the infiltration and possibly put the character in great danger. Ooh. You can also build a romantic connection, so you may be doing so to try and gain an asset, although your feelings could be genuine. This new partner becomes both a contact and an ally. The relationship ends if the character does not continue to pursue it in the next house management or chooses to make it permanent with marriage. Using the Seek Consort Venture, which is just below, that's difficulty four. You offer a proposal to a romantic partner in the hope of forming a marriage or at least making the relationship a more permanent one, such as that with a concubine or spouse. It can only be made with a romantic partner that has been maintained successfully for three house management sessions. Uh, if it's successful, you enter into a long-term affair. You have a partner an ally with a quality of two and someone the character can trust. You can also seek house favor, difficulty three, discipline. Make a point of proving their worth, dedication, and loyalty. If you're successful, reduce the difficulty of all interactions with their superiors in the house by one step until the next house management session. You can train subordinates, understand difficulty two, undertake a train regime with a human asset under their control, such as soldier. The asset gains plus one quality. The quality of any asset may only be improved by as much as plus two by this method. Finally, we have Warfare. So, taking an invasion force to another planet is a venture. Each single unit of any type that you move to another planet to invade costs five wealth. For this reason, many house conflicts tend to be hit-and-run attacks to teach their enemies a lesson. Um, you'd also need to charter a highliner, which is another adventure. Otherwise, you'd have to wait for them to come by on their set routes. If you place your forces on a standard route, this increases their chances of other agents and spies learning of their plans. When the forces arrive, the battleground is defending the house's homeworld. Each space on the planet is considered a zone for the Warfare conflict. Attacking forces all arrive in a group of five connected zones at least 10 zones away or as far as possible from the defender's estate. Planetary defenses usually make arriving any nearer impossible or suicidal. For the first two turns of the conflict, any ground or sea forces are considered in free fall as they are landing and cannot move or attack. The defender then needs to discover how many of their forces they can bring to bear against the attack. They roll a dice pool of d20s equal to the difficulty of, mil of their military level. The defender gains three assets of any type plus one more for each success and may place each asset on any zone. If the defender knows the attack is coming, they can double the result. On the attacker's turn, they may move an asset subtly or boldly as usual. They may also raise the zone or space where they have an attacking asset by using the asset in that zone. Ground and sea forces move to any adjacent zone as usual, but air assets can move up to three adjacent zones. Any move requires a move skill test, and any attempt to raise the zone requires a battle skill test. The base difficulty is the military power of the defender. If the move test fails, the unit is stuck and pinned down. If the attacker successfully raises a zone, it's destroyed as well as anything in it. Fa attackers and defenders may also destroy enemy assets as usual, as seen in the core rulebook. Where the defender has military facilities in certain spaces, they can be used as units that cannot move, although they are raised along with the zone until then they can attack any enemy assets. Any defensive assets in a zone increase the difficulty to raise it, but not move through it by one step as a defensive trait. The conflict carries on until the attackers are destroyed or they decide to withdraw, depending on the purpose of the conflict. A withdrawal takes two turns, and in this period all attacker assets are considered 
in flight, meaning ground and sea units can no longer attack or move. Either side may surrender. The terms of such would be up to the participants to role play out. Finally, you have the ascension from minor house to major. So uh, the easiest transition to make is from a nascent to established minor. Uh, a nascent house is simply new and has much the same status as any other minor house. To be truly accepted as an established minor house, the house will need to increase the number and status of its domain. When it has one primary domain, as well as the starting secondary domain, it can claim to be fully established. To go from ma minor to major is without doubt the most complex and difficult transition to make. It has lots of prerequisites, and it can cost the house a lot of enemies. So first you have to have one primary and two secondary domains as a minimum to claim the territory of a house major. You must control the planet. While it can be small, you must be the undisputed leading power on the planet. Other re resident houses may or may not owe it fealty, but the house must be able to claim dominion over their entire planet, and you owe allegiance to none but the Emperor. So you have to have claimed independence from other houses major. And that's the hardest part. You know, getting the resources, controlling the planet, you know, that may make other houses nervous, but when you change allegiances and a house major shifts its status, that can make people more nervous, because that may give their vassals ideas that they don't like. Going from major to great is actually easier than going from minor to major. Basically, to become great, you just need the audacity to claim the title and start using it. As with any other house ascension, they should control what is expected of a great house. So two and primary and three secondary domains. They should also have a status of at least 75, making a lot of people very nervous. Then they just start referring to themselves as a great house and bribe, convince a few corridors and allies to do the same. This is a venture using communicate, causing 50 wealth with a difficulty of five that must be succeeded three times in a row on separate and contiguous house management session. If any of the tests fail, the house loses 10 stages for their arrogance and presumption. They remain a major house, but there's nothing stopping them trying again. If they succeed, they claim great house status and drop to a status of 65, but on the great house track. Cool. Then we have our new plant record sheet. So you can list your facilities down here at the bottom, and you have your planet's worth of hex spaces here where you can put your facilities and stuff. We have a moon record sheet as well, which you can see here is oriented differently. So you have much less spaces here. You can give it a name, the ruling house, primary environment. Same as with the planet and a list of facilities. Um, then we have the house management record sheet, so that the name of your house, the session, number, the total wealth, total resources, and total upkeep that have happened, any news from the Imperium, any events that have happened, and ventures developed. And, you know, over time, you'll build up a stack of these as your house goes through all the different excitements of being a house in the world of Dune. Um, and finally, we have the house record sheet. So this has the house name, home world, house type, traits, status, active house roles, role, upkeep, costs. That's important. Keep that in mind. Uh, the five skills, battle, communicate, discipline, move, and understand, and the skill upkeep costs you need to pay. Also important. Overview, so your military power, which is your, you put your difficulty modifier here, and the upkeep costs here. Population loyalty, same again. Lifestyle, same again. Then your domain income. Put the name of your domain and the resources and wealth it generates in these here. Um, notice you have up to five because you could be a great house with two primary domains and three secondary and then you put your complete adventures and list them up down here and that in a very very long summation is the uh the great game houses of the lens right expansion for dune it's a thin book it's 128 pages and i was a little bit reticent to pay the cost to be honest because it came out at what i thought was a little bit of an unreasonable price given that you could buy much bigger expansions for say star trek for about the same price but it does have a huge amount of play value in it as you can see i mean the house management stuff is fantastic the info on all the, the houses is really good all the background stuff on the guild you know the new agents that you can have with the guild and chome and all that stuff is a lot of fun. New roles for player characters are always welcome. And as you'll see when we look at the next supplement, which focuses on the Emperor's Court, there are even more player character options in there as well as you expand the scope of your campaign even further out into the known universe of Dune. So anyway, I hope that was useful, and I do hope you're enjoying the second movie, those of you who are lucky enough to go and see it. I'm sure I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure it's gonna be fantastic. I really enjoyed the new one, and I'm an enormous fan of Dune and have been since I was preteen. If you enjoyed what you saw, please click like and subscribe just to keep me motivated, particularly the moment. Uh, a little bit of a, a boost is always appreciated. I really love that you guys tune in, and I hope you keep doing so. And so, feel free to leave any comments, chide me for anything I got wrong. I hope to see you in the comment section below, just talking about Dune and Dune-related stuff, and I hope to see you in the next video. So, until then, take care, and I'll see you soon. All right, bye-bye.